Carol Singer, will you step forward now? <laughs> <laughs> These are for you. <laughs> These are papers which will be available after I, I finish the talk. There are uh, 12 chapters in this, these books. And those of you who will be in the workshop tomorrow, please, uh, you need to uh, get one of those and try to read um, at least the first four articles. There are about 80 pages in all. But Carol will make this available at the end of the meeting. I want to thank Leo uh, and all the people on the committee to make this conference happen. I've heard wonderful things about it for years, and I've uh, never been able to uh, make it to one. I think it's a very important addition to the UFO conference scene uh, because it does enable and empower people to share what is real to them. And I almost apologetically will say that I did not get a chance to share my experiences today, but it was because I, I knew that you'd be sick of hearing me from tonight and tomorrow. Uh, the unfortunate part is that I usually don't have time to talk about my own experiences, and I usually will not talk about them, but in this setting, I will, but I don't have time to. But <laughs> <laughs> but it gets more complicated. It's a, a little like a Yiddish a sort of dance here. But what we will try to do is go through uh, the protocols that we're developing, and if we have time to, uh, later today or, or tomorrow to go into some of my personal experiences, we may. I honestly feel they're not important, except to myself, um, but uh, they are why I am here, standing before you. Before we get started, I'd like to go through a little exercise with everyone. And I'd like for everyone to sit with both their feet on the floor, Sit very comfortably. Close your eyes. Now take a very deep breath. Deep breath with your diaphragm and exhale all the way. Breathe in light and peace and exhale all your concerns, all your anxieties. Do that two or three more times. Now while quietly following your own breathing, become aware of your awareness. Become aware that you are awake. This is very simple. Know that you are awake, conscious, intelligent. Sit now and observe your own consciousness. Let awareness become aware of awareness. Know that your inner wakefulness is that which enables you to think to perceive, to feel, and to be. Now become aware of this pure, quiet consciousness. Deeply aware. It is not your thoughts, but it is that whereby you are able to think. This consciousness, it is not your perceptions. It is that whereby you are able to perceive. Do not confuse the two. It is not your feelings, but it is that whereby you are able to feel. It is not your ego, but it is that whereby you are able to perceive your ego. Look at your thoughts as they arise in your mind. Perceive deeply beyond the thoughts themselves to that faculty which permits you to perceive your thoughts, pure consciousness. Look at your individuality or ego. 
Become aware of the awareness that enables you to perceive your ego. Who is that? What is it whereby you may perceive yourself? Like a light shining through many windows of different size, shape, and color, this undifferentiated pure consciousness is streaming through countless individuals in the universe. Each individual, like a snowflake, is unique and beautiful, but the light which illuminates it is one. It is universal. It is unbounded. All of us are of it, but none of us possess it. It is there with all of us. It is silent consciousness. It is without bounds. It is beyond time and place. It is non-local, and yet it is everywhere. It is universal consciousness, and it is that whereby you are awake at this moment. Be silent and know that this is home. You may open your eyes when you're ready. <clears throat> the importance of that exercise that we just did will be clear by the end of this talk, I hope. Certainly by the end of tomorrow. I want to mention just a few things about how I happen to be here. What is a 36, almost 37 year old trauma physician, chairman of a department at a busy hospital with four daughters and a wife doing it in a place like this? <laughs> I love it. And I'll tell you that it's been a very long journey, and we can't get into the personal part of this right now, but suffice it to say, in 1990, 17 years after I had a close interaction, I do not use the term abduction, I got a swift kick in the behind by the cosmic will, and a number of things happened. The Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence is a nonprofit tax-exempt organization. We're all volunteers. The Truman Days, I guess they call them dollar-a-year people. I'm dollar-a-year. And it is dedicated to establishing a peaceful, sustainable, mutually cooperative relationship between humans and any and all extraterrestrial peoples presently or in the future visiting this planet. It is a diplomatic and scientific project. It consists of, at this point, some 250 to 300 working group members around the world who have formed working groups to go out to deliberately vector in spacecraft to a location and to send a diplomatic team. Someone mentioned earlier ambassador. That is precisely what we're trying to do. We have been sanctioned by no one officially, although officialdom knows we exist. We can get into that. And we have been brought together by a desire at once sublime and urgent. There is a gathering and an awakening, if I can use the word, an activation of kindred spirits on this planet who have decided that the time for speculation is over. The time for hurt and limitation is over. It is time for us to step into the light to bring this to the people of the planet and to formulate a project which will have a duration of at least a hundred years and probably one thousand to integrate this planet eventually 
with our brother and sister planets, which are already interacting with us. Now, we're going to be talking at length in a little while <clears throat> about an event which occurred on March 14, 1992 at 8.24 p.m. Central Standard Time in Gulf Breeze, Florida, where a CSETI training group were successful in vectoring in five spacecraft to our location. They came within 2,000 feet and signaled with us for 15 minutes. We will show you a tape of this. This was one of the a major turning point in this phenomenon. Not because it was so spectacular. Individuals have had closer interactions, as you all know, as many of you here have experienced. But the distinction is profound. It is an attempt to gather together people deliberately in the waking state to initiate an interactive episode with extraterrestrial peoples with the right reasons, with the right stuff. And we're going to get into what the new right stuff is. Forget what you heard from John Glenn. This event had about 50 witnesses. There are six audio videotapes, two audio tapes, and photographs of this event. There have been others. In the last 14 months, there has unfolded no fewer than six, what we will call CE5s, close encounters of the fifth kind. And we'll define that in a moment. And I think we have entered into a time of accountability, a day of reckoning, if you will. It is time for us to assume the responsibility to not just watch this phenomenon roll over us, or to passively observe it, or to idly speculate about it, but to go out there where it's happening with teams of people who have the right stuff, who have transcended fear, and to say, you are here, we will welcome you, and we will interact with you in a mutual and cooperative fashion. The time for that is now. There is not much time to achieve what we must do in the next decade, and we'll get into that in a little bit. I will say that we have hit what I thought we would be at in five to 10 years with this project in the first 14 months. So it gives me the thought that indeed there is a support from the universe for this endeavor. And for that reason, I feel compelled to share it with you in a very intimate and thorough way today. The implications of what happened on March 14th are immense, and those will become clear as we get further into this. But let me discuss first some, some definitional things. Everyone here know what a close encounter of the first, second, third, and fourth kind is. Anyone who does not, raise your hand. All right. Well, first, we'll just go through. First is a daylight sighting or a sighting within 500 feet. Second is a landing trace, a landing, electromagnetic effect radar tape, what have you. Close encounter of the third kind, as you all know, is the sighting of a humanoid with or without a spacecraft, usually with. Close encounter of the fourth kind is when an individual is taken on board a craft. We call that a close interaction, not an abduction, because that is prejudicial in our concept. And a close encounter of the fifth kind is a new category, which we have described as a human-initiated or human cooperative event that was voluntarily and deliberately undertaken by a human. Notice that all the other categories are essentially passive. You're somewhere and something flies by and you see it within 500 feet, that's a CE1. Some place an event occurs and there's a landing, it's a CE2. These are all passive. Our point is this. These peoples, and I'll use that term broadly, I hope it doesn't offend anyone, have been knocking on our back door, front door, some people said literally their front door, <laughs> side door, basement, roof, for 45 years. It is time for us to answer that knock. But it must be answered with clarity. It must be answered with vision. And it must be answered with the right motivations. We will get into some of that today. 
Let me give you an example of close encounter of the fifth kind, or CE5. The generic one that is plenty of places in the literature. We did a literature search and have found over a hundred of these. An individual is out someplace and they see a UFO. Rather than just being dumbfounded, as most people would be, you know, the, the, the usual response, even from a professional photographer, is to go, <laughs> and you know, and that's the extent of it. What we're talking about is someone who then goes to their car and gets a flashlight, takes it out, and flashes at the craft. Guess what? It stops and comes over and flashes back. Now you would say this has not happened. This has happened many, many dozens of times. Another example, an individual is doing a laser show for a rock concert. And they inadvertently, in this case, it doesn't quite meet our definition of a CE5, but we'll use it for example. And a UFO comes over and signals back with the laser or simply comes over to investigate what all this noise in the sky is about. We define these as first degree and second degree CE5s. And you'll excuse me if I obsess and compulse a little bit here. This is what doctors like to do. A close encounter of the first, fifth kind, first degree. There's no UFO in the area. An individual goes out deliberately using protocols to vector one in to their geographic location. Those are rather rare, but they do happen. Close encounter, the fifth kind, second degree. You just happen to be someplace. You see a UFO, but you have the presence of mind to wave, to signal with a light, to shout, to send a thought, and it interacts back with you. They're both CE5s, but there's few orders of magnitude difference between a CE5 first degree and second degree in terms of difficulty in, in causing that to happen. Why is this an important category? It's the first interactive, deliberate category. And the reason we think it's important is that if you look through the information that is out there, many people have had these experiences, have written them up, not known what they, what they were. They were like a diamond in the rough. And what we try to do is to get the dross and the carbon off that diamond and look and see what its value might be. And what we have found is that its value is in this, that humans can say, stop, and come and interact with us voluntarily, and they will. Many high percentage of cases where people have taken the initiative to do this, a UFO and or its occupants have indeed voluntarily interacted. If we do not see that this is possible and therefore attempt it, it will never happen. It's like everything. Nothing can happen until we create it here first. And we're creating a reality, and in the past have created a reality, that has been primarily involuntary and passive and reactive. What we want to move into is a reality that is proactive, deliberate, voluntary, cooperative. This is a order of magnitude jump. No longer are we talking about doing passive retrospective research. And let me mention what that, that refers to in the medical model. Retrospective research is when you look back and you do studies through case files and case histories. And almost all UFO research up to this time has been retrospective. Someone has a sighting or a report or an investigator goes out and takes the report. Someone has a close interaction or an abduction. Someone does a hypno. Uh, hypnosis session or what have you, and they find out what happened. Those are important. We must continue retrospective research. But what we have forgotten is the pure hardcore stuff. It's called proactive research or research looking into a model of pros what we have put together and it's meeting with some modest but important successes. I want to give you some examples of these close encounters of the fifth kind. And some of you have heard these, but they're quaint and they're very, very illustrative. One of the best, and it was investigated by Dr. Hynek on June 26, 1959, Father William Melchior Gill at the Boanani Mission in Papua New Guinea, 
along with 38 other people, saw a UFO over a three-hour period. There were four humanoids out on a deck light structure outside this UFO. 25 people signed a case report about this. The following night, almost the same time, June 27, 1959, interesting, this is the anniversary of that event. We should go out and see if they're hovering it. We'll wave. At 6.02 p.m., they saw this craft, and Father Gill had the presence of mind to wave at the humanoids. That's a very simple human thing. Hi. Guess what? They waved back, all right? Now, this was astonishing that, that this would happen. What happened after that is that all four humanoids began to wave at the human observers. And one of the mission boys went back and got a flashlight, and they started signaling in Morse code to the UFO. They then began swinging their arms in a pendulum in sort of a sequencing back with that Morse code signal. Now, this is highly significant. Remember, many, many observers of this, and no one has ever impugned the character of Father Gill. This is a solid case. Now, that was one of the earlier ones that we found, but there are more recent ones. One of the ones that I enjoy the most uh, is the story of uh, a caravan of truck drivers outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, on March 29, 1978. 9.30 p.m., and they were trucking along with their CBs on, talking. Suddenly, a UFO hovering overhead engulfed the entire caravan in a bright blue-white light. The trucks began to sputter. There were EM effects, electromagnetic effects. The CB radios went dead. It lasted only a couple of seconds. This, by the way, was observed by many people on the interstate, not in the caravan, multiple witnesses. After this, the, the rear truck driver after the UFO turned off its beam, shouted over his CB, Hey, UFO, if you have your ears on, I want to go with you. <laughs> Sounds like a truck driver. <laughs> Yo, bro, I'm going. All right, suddenly, suddenly, the blue light returned and stayed on this group for 15 seconds, which is a long time when you're driving down an interstate, resulting in the same EM effects as before. Now, was that a CE-5? We know that one wasn't mediated through waving or light. Now, follow how these are being mediated, what the modalities are, because we're going to get into that later when I talk about something called the Contact Trilogy. That was either through electromagnetic voice or telepathic. We don't know which, but there wasn't any light signaling. On October 23, 1980, five men multiple witnesses, all these are multiple witnesses cases. I only have picked out the ones that are solid multiple witnesses. Saw a boomerang shaped craft over a smelter, smokestack smelter in Arizona. It was a copper smelting uh, factory. The UFO shone brightly, a huge beam of light down directly into the smokestack. Well, it then accelerated towards the town of Stafford and took off. Joe Navarez then stated verbally that he wished the UFO would come back so he could get a better look. Immediately, the UFO did a 180-degree turn, came back, and went over a slag dump area and sat there long enough for them to look at it, and when they were, had their fill, it took off again. Now, was that verbal? Was it thought wave? We don't know. It was one of those two modalities, I think telepathic, quite frankly. Now, there are many of these. I don't have time to go into all of them, but these are in these papers. We have dozens of cases so that we've dug out, plus our own original research. What's interesting, if you read Dr. Hynek's last book, which he co-authored with Philip Imbrogno, it was actually published posthumously after Dr. Hynek died of a brain tumor in 1987. It was called Night Siege. Anybody read that book here? Great book. Very well done is about the huge wave that occurred in Hudson Valley, New York area. And this event is very significant because this book contains no fewer than half a dozen CE5s. They were not called that, they were not identified as that, but we have since looked at them and, and concluded that they were indeed CE5s, second degree. These are all second degree CE5s I'm giving you right now. Well, one of these people near Kent, New York on New Year's Eve in 1982, Edwin Hansen was driving home 
And he saw a huge boomerang-shaped UFO again, delta shape, with a brilliant searchlight going on the ground. Mr. Hansen thought to himself, I wish it would come closer so I can get a better look. Now remember, it was moving away from him at the time. As soon as he had that thought, the UFO began to descend and turned and came straight towards his car. He states that the object was huge and came very close, and as his anxiety increased, he states that a sort of communication occurred between him and the object. He states, quote, I felt thoughts that weren't my own, but a kind of voice telling me not to be afraid. Now, also from this same event, on March 17, 1983, Dennis Sant, near Brewster, New York, saw a large triangular or delta-shaped UFO over I-84. It's a major corridor going out of New York City, outside New York. Many cars and trucks were stopped. It actually caused a traffic jam on the interstate. It was seen by so many people. Some of these sightings, by the way, were seen by up to 5,000 people on an evening. Completely silent, huge, very reminiscent of the, uh, or I should say predictive of the Belgian wave. Dennis Sant stopped and he was with his family. And he remembers saying to himself, I wish I could get a better look at it. As soon as he had that thought, it did a 360 degree rotation as if searching, stopped as if rotating on a wheel, and then started to float in my direction. It continued to approach me and I just stood there transfixed, I bet. <laughs> it stopped 40 feet from me and was hovering 20 feet above a telephone pole in front of my house. Now this was witnessed by his family and other people. Remember, these things were in the hundreds of feet diameter and it was about 40 feet away. That's a close encounter. Now there are cases where people have had close encounters of the fifth kind, first degree. They've been reported. And one of the, the, the ones that uh, I find most interesting uh, was uh, occurred in 1978 in San Diego, California. Mr. Liebert, who is a promotion individual who set up laser and light shows for grand openings and premieres and what have you, was setting up this show and he had a 22 watt argon, green argon spectrophysics laser. Now that's a powerful laser. The 22 watt don't sound like much, but believe me, it's a lot. A one watt laser is powerful. You've got to have a cooling tower and everything else for that one that powerful. And as he was doing that, making this big display in the sky, where normally there is no such display, and remember San Diego is a ma major nuclear weapons yard, through the opening in the roof, he and 10 other people saw a large V-shaped UFO pass overhead no higher than 100 feet above them, completely silent, perhaps a faint hum. And he was convinced that it was there checking out what this laser activity was where normally there was none. He's also convinced that at other places where he's had openings that UFOs have come, been seen by many people and that they were attracted to the laser activity. Now there are many other close encounters of the, of the fifth kind, first degree. And I don't know whether to get into this can of worms here. I will, five minutes. This gets personal. This is written up in one of these papers and is not identified as my experience, but it was. Yeah, I wrote it as if it was someone else's. Chicken. <laughs> You know, it takes a lot of guts to do this stuff. <laughs> we'll talk about that. In 1973, I was hiking on a mountaintop outside of Boone, North Carolina in the Appalachian Mountains. <clears throat> now, the, the preface to this is, at starting about eight years of age, I had a number of experiences. I woke up with this person I thought was skeleton-like coming out of my closet, and I'd wake up underneath the bed, and there's a whole, whole story with that. In 19, uh, from then on, for about three years, I was obsessed. I collected everything on UFOs I could collect. Of course, I was only, see, this would have been uh, 1963 to 65 when I was eight to 10 years old. I was born in 1955. And there was a, a number of, uh, a great deal of activity. And I had, my, my parents were just wondering what in the world's wrong with this boy. I had a stack this high of magazines, Life, True, everything I'd get my hands on. That kind of faded. <clears throat> and then 
a number of events happened in my life, but one of them was that I was hiking on a mountaintop in Boone in 1973, and I saw a UFO at sunset. This was a 5,500 foot mountain, completely deserted at that time, known as Rich's Mountain. The only thing up there was a fire tower. The look was called it a fire tower. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about it for the fire tower. Anyways, a, a fire tower, not to be confused with fire tower. But uh, as I can joke like this, I was born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. So. As I saw the sunset, and by the way, it was in October of 1973, and I have since learned that that was a month of a great deal of CE3s and CE4s, as it turns out. I knew nothing of that at the time. It was also during the crisis in the Yom Kippur War when we almost had Armageddon. I'm here to tell you, having lived in Israel and talked to top military people, we came this close to a thermonuclear war with the Soviets that month. And that's why all that activity happened in October of 73. I'm willing to bet you anything. Anyway. It was a deserted place. It was very cool. A beautiful high pressure front had swept in from Wyoming or someplace, and it was cold, <laughs> clear air. And I had a ski jacket on, and I hiked up there by myself to see the sunset because I always loved nature. And my father, uh, my grandmother is pure Cherokee Indian. I think I have a real feeling for those mountains. And uh, so I would go there to commune with nature and be with the spirit of the universe. And as I was watching the sunset, I saw this other thing beside the sun that shouldn't have been there. I thought at first it was an airplane, then didn't have any lights on it, and it was still. And then I thought it was a helicopter, and then I was quite sure it wasn't that either. And it came closer, and you could see an oval-shaped thing, but it was still a mile or two off. It wasn't very close. It wasn't a CE-1 even. And I thought, well, that's interesting. It looks like I saw a UFO, and I forgot about it. It got dark. The stars came out. It was beautiful absolutely crystal clear and, and at that time not any development in that area so you could really see the Milky Way and as I was turned to leave to go down this Jeep trail uh, that was had a locked gate at the base of it you could only hike up there unless you had a key for the bar tar <laughs> and, and as I was going down the road I turned to look at the sky and I had a thought that I thought was most peculiar and it was something to the effect of Behold what a beautiful universe God has made. I turned and walked down the road, and I felt there was someone on my right side. And I turned just in time to see that my jacket was being indented, and I was touched on my right shoulder by a finger. And it immediately, all the hair went on me. You know, and I don't know if it was physiologic or if it was electromagnetic or what, but I went just complete. I got into the side, and I'm just, you know, I'm a six foot four guy, 18 year old guy, you know. I got into the ditch and curled up in a fetal position and looked over and I remember looking over at this creature and thinking, what is this strange animal looking at me for? <laughs> well, at any rate, I remember the next thing I, I consciously remembered until a few years later, and I've since remembered a great deal of what happened during the missing time, was that I was, uh, appeared on the road and I felt, how did I get this far down the road? And my sense was I had floated there. That's all I knew. I said, I knew I had floated to that point. And I went back down to town, happy as a lark, got down to town, and it was deserted. I said, what the hell happened? A nuclear war. And the place looked like a ghost town. It should have been about 9.30. It was about 11.30 or 12. Anyway, for the next several months, as I would go to bed, I would use a technique, which we have called coherent thought sequencing, and UFO sightings appeared every night I did this. I would go to sleep doing this, and I have to tell you honestly, what was really happening is that there was a link up with these peoples investigating what a human's experience of universal consciousness was, or cosmic consciousness. That's all I'll say, but it, that was, I was teaching them what it was like for a human to experience universal mind. These CE5s happened over and over again. At first I thought it had to be a coincidence, but it wasn't. I forgot about it. I, I stopped when it got so close that a guy who looked just like me was stopped on a highway with a humanoid outside the, his car window looking in at him and it had a picture of this guy in the paper and he looked like me. And I said, whoa, that's it. <laughs> Time out. So I kind of put that on the shelf. Interestingly, a few months later, my roommate, when I was in a little tiny college dorm, and 
he said, you know, I never mentioned this to you, and this guy was blind, and I would read to him uh, as a tutor. And he said, I never told this to you, but I would wake up many times. He, he didn't sleep well during these months that I'm relating here. And I would hear you talking, and this is the exact words he used, in a language not of this world. I said, why the hell didn't you record it? <laughs> I never have... <laughs> I haven't recorded, uh, I have never told him, nor does he know to this day, these experiences. I was deeply in the closet about this until 1990. No one but my wife and a couple of people knew. Um, in 1975, I decided to see if this would work. <clears throat> and I was in Isola, France with Maharishi. I was one of Maharishi's golden boys. I was a TM teacher, instructor of Transcendental Meditation. And I did this and we went out and it was about one o'clock after lunch and I was with about ten people and we looked up and lo and behold here was a huge broad daylight at one in the afternoon a crystal clear sky a gigantic tetrahedral shaped UFO hovering there I thought well that maybe that was a coincidence I kept writing all these things off as a coincidence then in 1977 there was a multiple witness CE5 that happened. I decided to see, I had come back to the United States and was living up in Blowing Rock again, up in the mountains of North Carolina. So I wonder if there's anything to that. I, I was always someone at that point who doubted my own experience. I've since learned not to do that, nor should any of you. And I thought to myself, we'll see. So I went to bed and I did this same technique that I had either inducted or taught or been taught or taught them. I don't know how it evolved. And I had visualized them coming up through Charlotte. And this is how, you know, I was a young kid. I was still only, what, uh, 1977, I was 22. And I said, I'll see if we can vector them in. But I said, I need to tell them. So I said, my name is Stephen. And I was born on June 28, 1955 at Mercy Hospital in Charlotte. And I visually and graphically showed them all these details. And then from there, I guided them up to the mountains where I was living. Guess what? My roommate and I, who was in another bedroom, he and I woke up with this huge ship orbiting above our house, an incredible blue-white light from it. And what was even more strange is that the house was filled with the consciousness of the people on board. All I can say is that, that their individual, the consciousness filtered through their snowflake, their individuality, was projected into that house. Well, my roommate and I both woke up, ran out into the common hall and said, God, did you see that? Yeah, did you see that? And we were dumbfounded. At that point, the craft came across and went over towards Grandfather Mountain and made a sweeping arc and was gone. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather when the next morning, first of all, my roommate was furious. He said, don't ever do, I told him what I had done. He said, don't ever do that. It scared the hell out of me. <laughs> he was really mad because I had never told him about these experiences. And he, I can tell you his name and he, he remembers this to this day. In fact, he called me not long ago and said, do you remember back in 19? I said, yeah, I remember. I don't like, usually I don't tell this story when I give these talks because I'm embarrassed because it's self-referencing and I don't like to self-reference, but I'm doing it here because that's what we're supposed to do, right, Leo? I'm being a good student of yours. <laughs> it's hard for me to do this, actually. Um, Snoopy 2, the police helicopter in Charlotte, just before the UFO was seen over our house, had pursued these two of these UFOs Guess what? Over southeast Charlotte, over the hospital where I was born. Now, this gets weird. <laughs> when, I don't know if anything's weird for this group, but this gets the close. <laughs> and it was witnessed by, now I have secreted away uh, through all manner of nefarious what, manipulations, gotten the radar, the FAA tower audio between the tower controller and the pilot of the police helicopter documenting this event. This, by the way, was in the Charlotte Observer. It was seen by multiple people on the ground. It was seen by other pilots. And they got within 200 feet of this metallic, they could clearly see a metallic structured craft. Well, interestingly, it was seen leaving the area, moving towards the Northwest Mountains, which is where I was located. Now, at that point, I decided, I couldn't write this off as a coincidence. <laughs> 
It took a while. I had to give a swift kick in the ass by the cosmic mind. Anyway, <laughs> at that point I decided this indeed was real, that, that it was something that I should not do um, lightly, and stopped until 1990. And I'll tell you this story. Is this boring to hear these personal things? <laughs> All right, let me go. If you, if you repeat outside this room that, that, that I'm telling you this story, I'll deny it and I'll tell you, I'll say that you are all mass hallucinating, I can prove it. I've got a psychologist here. All right. Now, it, it's very tricky because I'm an emergency physician and I commit quite a few people who are certifiably psychotic. And so I have a healthy respect. All right, 1990. I was walking through my room. This is, what, 17 years after the initial event in 1973. And I had told no one but one or two very close friends and my wife, God bless her. And I was walking across my room, and we live in this large house on this, these estate grounds. There's nothing nearby. We, no TV was on, no radio was on. I've never had this happen. I'm not someone who hears things or see things that aren't there. I was not drinking. I'm a teetotaler, nor do I do drugs, nor did I do psychedelics. I do all these qualifiers because this is too bizarre. <laughs> but I was walking across the room, and I was getting undressed. I mean, it was a very prosaic, mundane sort of evening. I was getting undressed, and it was the full moon of January 1990. Full moons are important to me. Maybe an astrologer will tell me why. I'm June 28, 1955, born at 6 in the morning. At any rate, a voice, as clearly as mine is speaking now, a male voice said, pick up that which you have dropped. <laughs> I said, uh, I said, say what? <laughs> you know, now here's a conservative, you know, I live in North Carolina. I mean, look, you've got Jesse Helms there. It's, it's worse than the neo-Nazis in Germany. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, that can't be excused for being a, excused for being a centric because he's a psychiatrist. I do hardcore trauma, life and death stuff. People die in my hands. And I'm going, you know, this is getting too weird. But at any rate, I accepted that. But as soon as those words were uttered, I knew I was awakened to do what I'm doing now. And for each month, for three months, on the full moon, January, February, March, 1990, I had extraordinary experiences, which I, I really don't have time to go into, but including one that where I was taken out into the solar system and shown craft that were orbiting and charging off electromagnetic fields of other planets in preparation for events on this planet during the 1990s, and it's a major story. It's, a, it's an ex That I you know, don't expect any of you to believe because there's no corroborating things. The rest of this I do have corroboration for. There were witnesses to these other CE5s. That's how the concept of a CE5 came about. It was through personal experience. Now it was shortly after that that I was awakened in my room in Asheville, North Carolina. And all I can say is that there was a beautiful light that came into the room. And I was awakened about 2.30, and I sat down and I wrote the principles of the CE5 initiative, which are in that package. And from there, this whole thing started. Anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Let me move on. Where was I anyway before I got to... <laughs> It's not safe for me to start talking about my personal experiences. Get lost in space. The importance of these CE5s cannot be overestimated. And I think that when we start looking at what it means and when we look at what's happened, we have all been given pieces of a puzzle. I haven't been given the whole puzzle. You have pieces, I have pieces, everyone has pieces. Time to pull it together, friends, and now's the time. And one of the fascinating things that we have found is that at every stage of this endeavor, an unseen hand has opened every door that has needed to be opened. In fact, as soon as we give utterance to the fact that we need X, a phone call comes in offering X, and sometimes Y, Z, and some other things that we hadn't anticipated. 
it's an amazing that that's an amazing story in itself and, and my wife and I and the C-SETI executive committee and board have just been amazed at how this has unfolded but let me talk about for just a moment something that I think is more important and transcends our experiences, transcends our research. And that is what I call the imperative of consciousness. Now this takes several forms. Not only our ability to appreciate consciousness in its most universal aspect, because if we wish to have a relationship with peoples who have evolved on other star systems, I'm going to have to let go of a lot of our egocentric, anthropocentric, ethnocentric stuff. And the safest and fastest way to do that is to appreciate unbounded consciousness, non-local mind. It's just, it is imperative. It is not a luxury. But there's also the question of relativistic aspects of consciousness, such as our motivations. We are talking about setting up a program to diplomatically make a liaison with and a sustainable relationship with any and all, without exclusion, extraterrestrial peoples visiting this planet at this time or in the foreseeable future. What's the right stuff to make that happen? Let me tell you what the right stuff ain't. Have a conversation with the Defense Intelligence Agency and you'll find out what the right stuff ain't. <laughs> if I want to have a relationship with you and the only thing I'm interested in is acquisition of something you got, that is a crummy basis for a relationship and it shall fail. Exploitation, acquisition, self-aggrandizement, self-profiteering, all these things that have dominated this field and has dominated human endeavor for centuries is moribund and it will not work. I am here to tell you that an aboriginal with a campfire out in the outback of Australia with the right intentions, with a pure heart, will be more successful in a sustainable relationship with these people than the entire national security agency with $40 billion at its disposal. The reason for that is because I'm quite convinced, and I think there's ample evidence to support this statement, that they are able to assess our intentions, both through conventional and non-conventional means. And if our intentions are to acquire extraterrestrial or foreign technology, to use a euphemism, for the purposes of making a better bomber or a better bomb, this is an inappropriate motivation. If our motivation is the acquisition of photographic videotape or other evidence which may be then sold to the National Enquirer for five million dollars, this is an inappropriate and wholly corrupt motivation and it shall fail. If our motivation is to exploit rather than get to know, then we will not succeed in this endeavor. This, my friends, is the absolute minimum that we must achieve. Now, along the same lines is something which gets me in more trouble. I step in more deep doo-doo with this, and I'm going to say it, and that's it. I say it just because I think it's true. If I think that you are hostile, though I know very little about you, I will do things that will fulfill that assumption. One of the key things to the CSETI CE5 initiative foundation is the assumption of non-hostility. Now this has gotten me in deep trouble with some people who have reached conclusions that there are good ETs and bad ETs and evil ETs and sinister ETs and devilish ones and, and other what have you. Our position is we cannot make that kind of conclusion based on the information we have, nor must we enter into that type of conclusion. On the other hand, I am equally opposed to those who view them as superior space gods. 
it is important for us to be able to uh, go out into this phenomenon with what I call an appropriate collective self-esteem. Now let me tell you what that word means to me. It means that we neither view ourselves as morally superior or the center of the universe and all others are inferior or some others are inferior, nor does it allow for us to view ourselves as inferior to these extraterrestrial peoples. Let me make a very clear distinction here between sameness, all right, and equality. I am equal as a spirit and a soul to Leo and to you and to everyone in this room. We are equal. We're not the same. I am superior in some faculties and you are superior in some. This is on the relativistic sphere. The fact that an extraterrestrial civilization may have achieved superior technological, intellectual, or other feats, even telepathic and psi technology feats, does that make them superior? It makes them different. The big difference here between equality and sameness, we confuse it all too often in the human endeavor. How many relationships are broken up because people want to be the same when they cannot be, rather than seeing that they are equal spirits? Okay. The assumption of non-hostility is vitally important because if we do not have this firmly in our minds, we won't be able to go out to a remote ranch and look at the sky and intentionally use lasers and tones and whatever, and I'll get into this in a minute, what we're using to vector the, the spacecraft into your location. Because you're going to say, well, I only want the ones that are blonde-haired and blue-eyed and have white skin, and they're from the Pleiades. But the ones that are dark and smell funny and don't look like me, I want them to go away. You know, this is nothing but manifest racism. I'm going to call it what it is. And I think that, I think that we will fail if we are not able to achieve a certain amount of diplomatic open-mindedness about this and back off from the tendency to reach prejudicial negative conclusions about any of these peoples that are visiting the planet. Are they all the same? No. Are they equal? Yes. And are we equal with them? Absolutely. And for that reason, on the basis of consciousness, on the basis of spirit, if you will use that word, we can relate to any people in the universe. And the motto of C. SETI is, one universe, one people. One universe, one people. Now, this doesn't mean that these are going to be unimportant points, that there will be tasks, there will be barriers to overcome, just as there are barriers between a Kenyan tribesman and a New Yorker. All right, that's on our same planet here. Now, we know that there are going to be problems. There are going to be different ethical standards, different procedural standards, different political and social organization, different uh, levels of understanding of reality. But we must not allow those differences to cause us to conclude hostility. And let me just make, a, I want to make a sidetrack here, and some of you have heard this before. The very key point that we must be free of making the assumption or making the confusion between actions and motivations. This is not intuitively obvious to a lot of people. But let me paint a scenario for you. <clears throat> you are seeing this from a distance. Just pretend that you're you know, seeing this on a television screen. And there is this room that's white and there are these examining tables, and there are these lights. And there is a boy, eight years old, lying on the table. And he's being held down by half a dozen beings dressed in strange outfits. And one of them, the leader of this group, is going into his chest with a item this big around and putting a hole into his chest and he's awake. I just described what I did the other day. All right, 
I just described what I did as an emergency physician when a child was hit by a car, had a crushing injury to the chest, had five minutes to put a chest tube in before it was dying of a tension pneumothorax, and the child was awake. Head was an injury, chest was crushed, wasn't breathing. From the level of the awareness of the child, <clears throat> that action, I was a tormentor. I was a sadist. Let me go. And often I will hear these patients say, I'm fine, just let me go home. Of course, they're dying. They have a blood pressure of 40 over zip, and they're, you know, I'm fine, let me go. However, my motivations were what? I was trying to save the life of that child. For this reason, this is one reason why we don't use the term abduction, because it's not clear, you know, if the Titanic is sinking and you're plucked off the bow, it's a question of whether are you abducted or are you rescued. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's some argument here as to whether or not the Earth is the Titanic that's sinking rather rapidly. And if you listen to our geophysicists and our environmentalists and what have you, we are indeed sinking faster than the Titanic did, and there aren't many life rafts out there. So my point here is I'm not saying that that's the case. However, so long as that's a possibility, let's be clear on giving peace a chance. Let's be clear on giving the future a chance and approach this with a diplomat. I often say that we're the Switzerland of UFO research groups and we try to maintain this very clearly and, and, the, and, you know, and it's critically important. It's not just philosophically important, it is practically important because it is poison for a person to try to go out into a active UFO area, such as Gulf Breeze or Belgium or Puerto Rico, and intentionally vector these things into your geographic location if you have reached a conclusion that some of them are gonna eat you for lunch, <laughs> all right? So this, this sort of thinking is not only dangerous, but it is self-fulfilling because invariably, uh, it's very much akin to the white man coming to, uh, and I, I feel personally about this since my grandmother was Cherokee and was marched on the Trail of Tears out to Oklahoma, that if we just go, you know, when the white man came to North America and saw the Native Americans, different color, smelled different, different customs, talked different, kill the barbarians, what the hell, they're different from us. We have to be very careful that we do not slip down that very treacherous slope. And I am here to tell you that we have slipped down it way too far already. Very dangerous. What's going on is very dangerous. All right. So that is the imperative of consciousness involves not only our ability to have a assumed non-hostility, but also what our motivations are, uh, what the intentions of the team are, and what we intend to do with the information we get. I was asked by a national security agency operative, what are you gonna do with this stuff if you're gonna be collecting it? I said, well, depending on the material, it'll be simulcast worldwide on CNN and, and C BBC. And he went, you know, it's like his worst nightmare coming true. Here I am, his name's Steve Greer. Uh, I was always a Meshuganite. <laughs> I'm, I'm staying very much in character, those who know me well. Uh, but seriously, the, these are very big questions, and, and we're going to get into that in more de depth tomorrow. But I, I wish to emphasize that consciousness is not only important from a procedural point of view, but our attitudes and our spirits and how we approach this is critically important. It will make the difference between success and failure what our intentions are, what our assumptions are, what our prejudices are. Can we transcend our prejudices? Can we transcend our fears? We must. And the time for doing it is now. There's very little more time left before there will be events that will be seen all over the world simultaneously. And I am here to tell you that will happen within the next 10 years and possibly within the next two to five. And we had better get prepared to deal with this without the hysteria that has attended this topic up to this time. Now, I'd like to talk about something which I call the full spectrum of reality. 
and I usually do this early on in my talk, and I, I'll do it now because I, I, I admit it, I got so sidetracked with my personal stuff. I'm going to need some psychotherapy tonight. Over. <laughs> All right. When we say UFO, we're referring to a structured extraterrestrial spacecraft. There are other things that people see as UFOs that have nothing to do with extraterrestrials at all, but that's when I, when I use that term. When I use the term extraterrestrial, I'm not referring, I'm specifically I'm not referring to ultra-terrestrials or transcendentals, although there is some overlap. I'm referring to biological, physical, extraterrestrial peoples who have extraterrestrial physical spacecraft. Now, with that said, to confuse the picture a little bit, I will say this, that they're interdimensional. But one of the amazing things is, is I, I brought with me an interdimensional object, and, I, and I'm holding it here before you, and I'm not being facetious. Every state of reality is present here. It is wholly dependent on the level of consciousness of the perceiver. Someone who has the discernment will see God within this box. Someone with the discernment will see every dimension and every capacity for dimensionality right here. This, by the way, is a scientific fact, and the research has been done to establish that this is so. Not only is this thing not simply a three-dimensional box, but my mind can interact with this and can levitate it across the room, it can transmute it, et cetera, and so on. For this reason, we try to get real clear that what we're attempting to contact is not... Now, don't get me wrong, I have no doubt that there are angels and I have no doubt that there are other uh, aspects where there's primarily non-three-dimensional physical. When I was 17, I... Actually, six months before this 1973 experience, I was septic, was very sick, I coded, I died, I went out. It's a long story. I decided to come back because I asked them what they wanted me to do, and they said, we want you to come back, and I said, fooey on you, but I'll do it anyway. So here I am. I didn't want to come back. But that's not the point. What we want to be clear on is that we are attempting to establish a liaison between extraterrestrial peoples and extraterrestrial civilizations. In order for us to understand this, however, we're going to be, we must begin to entertain the concept of the full spectrum of reality. And let me use an analogy. There is this light shining here. And up until a few years ago, all we saw was the visible spectrum of this light, of the electromagnetic field. However, there are ultraviolet rays, gamma rays, X-rays, infrared, you name it, in the electromagnetic spectrum. The fact that we did not perceive it did not mean it did not exist. We simply did not have the capacity to perceive it at that point in our evolution. What we are seeing with this phenomenon is both what I call transcendental technologies or technology-assisted consciousness and conscious-assisted technologies and very, very developed physical technologies. The unfortunate thing about scientists is each generation thinks they know everything. So Galileo's generation did, Carl Sagan's generation does. Wrong. I, you know, we probably know 1% of what there is to know, even about the physical reality of the universe. Give me a physicist who can tell me what gravity is. They don't even have a clue what gravity is, nor can they manipulate it. These people can. So what we're dealing with are peoples who are operating on a wider view of the full spectrum of reality. It's not a different reality. Reality is one. Reality is a singularity, though we perceive it as many. The reality is that these peoples have technologies and intrinsic mind capabilities psi technologies, if you will, that enable them to function on a little bit wider aspect of the full spectrum of reality. No one but the Creator, in my opinion, 
functions on the complete spectrum of reality, so we shouldn't feel so bad, <laughs> okay? It's not a matter of inferiority, it's a matter of difference. And my friends, if you were to go back 200 years and show somebody a hologram or a television set, you'd be burned at the stake. They'd say, who is this from another world, okay? So this is something that we need to begin to look at. We need to begin to look at this phenomenon and the world around us with what I call the eye of oneness, the capacity to see with the eye of oneness that brings together what appear to be paradoxical and irreconcilable differences. This is what will save us from making the mistakes of dualism, reductionism, fragmentation that we have made over and over again in our attempts to appreciate the nature of reality. This, by the way, is not a luxury for the UFO researcher at this point in time. It is an absolute prerequisite. And those who cannot appreciate this simply will never have a clue about what they're dealing with. But I am here to say that this talk about them being interdimensional is a little bit confusing because you are interdimensional. I have a physical body. It's going to rot someday. So do you. But you also have aspects of your existence related to mind, consciousness, soul. And these are not going to rot with the body. And moreover, they already capa have capacities to do everything I have ever heard an extraterrestrial biological entity do. I have either seen or performed levitation, telekinesis, precognition, telepathy, telepathy all right, et cetera, and so on. These are all things within the human purview. These are within our capacity. The fact that all of us haven't developed them only means that we haven't developed them. Same thing with these peoples. So I think we need to begin to look at this in a much more unified way, that we're not so different. I think we are more alike than we are dissimilar. And that indeed, we are more kindred than we are alien. And, no, we are alien. You're alien. Well, maybe somebody's alien. I don't know who's alien, but they are alien. <laughs> it's a Freudian slip. I didn't mean to say that. But, whatever. Okay. But that's a very important point. What is our point of unity? What is our point of oneness? Invariably, it comes to one thing. And let me say also that this is a very key point because it is something which eliminates many problems. In the Bhagavad Gita, as Arjuna was on the battlefield with Krishna, Arjuna was told, and he was relating to Krishna his trepidations about the battle ahead. And Krishna said, a little of this eliminates all fear. And the this that he was speaking of with a capital T is nothing but your essential nature. It is consciousness. It is pure consciousness that transcends your individuality. If you are awake right now listening to me, you are able to access transcendental reality. You are accessing it right now. So this is something which is not only an essential tool of communication, we're going to get into that in a minute as I talk about the contact trilogy, but it is also an essential component of our ability to enter into this kind of extraordinary research. It is not a luxury. Let me comment also that it is intuitively obvious to me, it isn't to the people at SETI, not to be confused with CSETI. SETI is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which is the $100 million boondoggle with microwave listening posts. CSETI is something totally different. <coughs> what, makes you th what, what makes these people think that if you're dealing with the peoples, and particularly anyone who would make it here, of course the premise is that they haven't made it here yet, although they know damn good and well they have, it's a, it's a smoke and mirrors. Uh, the whole thing is a joke. But the, it's also the right hand not knowing what the left hand's doing, I know that too, I mean, it's a, it's a big problem, it's, it's government, what can I say? Uh, but, <laughs> but if you wanted to go to Zeta Reticuli, say your home base is Zeta Reticuli 1, and you're here, of orbiting the moon on a space station involved with research on this earth. And you wanted to say, good morning, mission control, how are you? And they say, fine, thank you, how is your you know, mission going? That transmission just took 74 years. It's 37 light years each way. 
using microwaves, radio waves, what have you. This is rubbish. Forget it. Any star-faring people, perforce, will have to develop the means of communications which are what I call transluminal, beyond light speed, beyond the barrier of light. And the most efficient means is innate consciousness. Because if you wish to contact, if I wish to contact Emily at home, it's 11.10 now, she's going to bed, that can be done instantly. I don't need AT&T. So can you. And the importance of this fact is that this is something which I quite am sure is an evolutionary uh, uh, prerequisite of any civilization which has reached the point of attempting inter or intrastellar travel. Because you simply can't communicate with home by any other means. The beauty of it is that you can receive a transmission before it's sent also because consciousness transcends space-time. So let's start talking about what the C-SETI protocols involve, and I'm going to have to rush on through because I'm running out of time. We're going to go into this in great detail tomorrow. There is a contact trilogy. If you listen to the accounts that I just shared with you, you will see that there are several components. Light, sound, and remarkably, thought. We may not understand how the last one fully works, but we know it works. Now, the light, the component that we're using, I usually have them with me, but the people haven't arrived from Denver yet, so I can demonstrate that. But we have some high-powered lights that are portable, half a million candle power, million candle power, one and a half million candle power, that we use for signaling to these craft. They are also used for making displays in the sky that are intelligent to vector them in. We are also looking into advanced laser systems. The glitch there is that they must be portable, they must not require a cooling system, and therefore you have limitations on power and there's a lot of technical problems. But we have some excellent people working on that. So the light laser end of it is one part of our contact trilogy, and these are used for vectoring in a spacecraft into your geological, geographical location. The other part of the contact trilogy is sound. Now, you heard today, and I'll play again for you here in a moment, some tones that were p recorded in the crop circles in England. And I am quite convinced that that is no grasshopper warbler or whatever. Uh, because I have interviewed the people who were there, and I have seen the original clippage and footage, and it's quite clear to me that this was a technologically mediated gift. It occurred while the mics were open. It occurred with a numerous uh, recording equipment present, and I do not think that was an accident. I do not think it was a coincidence. I don't believe in that kind of coincidence anymore. I've learned my lesson. And I think that it is very important. The reason, now the second tones you're going to hear, we're going to hear two tapes. The second one are beeping tones that were recorded off a spacecraft about three, 400 feet from the people in Ontario in 1975, there was a two-year period where in Alberta and Ontario, there were multiple farm families that had spacecraft come over and they would have this beep, 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 beep tone that would be heard. So that is the second tone. The reason we're using these tones in situ, out on the site, is because our sense is that if they can vector onto our, they can lock onto our research group and they hear a tone that they generated, then it will be something like a beacon that will let them know that indeed we are attempting contact back with them. And it also helps with recognition. You know, if you walk into someone's house and there's a million photographs on the wall, but there's a picture of you, you go, oh, look, there I am. There's a certain innate, okay, so there's a certain innate, so we're using this, you know, rather than some man-made sound, we're using these sounds that we think are a gift, and there are two different sets. Let's play the first one again, uh, and you've heard it, those of you who are here, but some of you weren't here for the talk uh, on the crop circles. Go ahead. That's the original. It's reduced in speed half each time now. It's binodal, there too.
it. Go ahead and play tape B now. The second tape uh, that you're going to hear was recorded in Alberta, uh, I'm sorry, Ontario. Uh, you will hear uh, some narration at the beginning. The person who has conveyed this to me is a CSETI working group uh, member in Florida and uh, has had multiple close encounters of various types. But this was heard for two years by multiple farm families. We have at least three different recordings from different families at different times of this beeping tone, tone emanating from a spacecraft uh, that was visually seen. This was definitely associated with a physical structured craft. Go ahead. Some of you have heard this before. the change okay you haven't even cut that off we actually have three different recordings some of which are better than that but uh, I, the intro I, I wanted you to hear from uh, Lindy Tucker who is a uh, colleague of ours in Florida now the third part of the contact trilogy is consciousness this is the part that uh, gets us in the most hot water with uh, nuts and bolts scientists and physicists but it's an important part, and that is the use of something called coherent thought sequencing. And this technique is one we'll go into tomorrow. Well, essentially, it is based on the premise that there have been multiple observations of people seeing spacecraft, sending a thought, simply thinking, and having it react. Now this, we have interviewed people in Belgium, in Latin America, in the United States, all over the world, plus our own experiences, that this is indeed a reality. Now, the fact that I cannot explain fully how that is operating doesn't mean it can't be empirically observed and implemented. This is what real science is all about. And that is exactly what we're trying to do. It's interesting to note that there is some evidence to suggest from a number of people who've had very close interactions 
that this is not only innately possessed by these occupants, but is also in all likelihood technologically mediated. And by that I'm saying that there is a technology-assisted consciousness and also a consciousness-assisted technology, two separate things that are operative here. We are already in the early stages of trying to evolve systems like that ourselves on this planet. Uh, CIA and the KGB has spent millions of dollars on it. But um, suffice it to say that, that I'm quite convinced that the appreciation of non-locality of mind or expanded consciousness followed by uh, a vectoring in a sequential uh, thought process that not verbally but visually and in, in a substantive way vectors them into a geographical location is efficacious and in fact we've had multiple successes using that so these by the way are all used at the same time there'll be a team of people doing CTA a coherent thought sequencing while there's a group using lights or lasers and the tones are being played and we're not using these in, in a singular way we're using all of the modalities that we have um, rather than trying to split off and use only one and see what results we feel we don't have time <laughs> to do that, so we're going ahead and using all of them. So we feel that this is a very, very important uh, uh, concept that consciousness uh, is non-local. And while we think that my mind is here and your mind is there, a very great physicist uh, who is actually the father of modern particle wave theory, Erwin Schrodinger, stated that the total number of minds in the universe is one. And I think that is a literal and scientific fact. In fact, research at Princeton, research at Stanford, and other facilities have established that mind or consciousness is not localized either to our bodies or to time-space, and that if we can evolve systems for utilizing mind or consciousness, that it can be a very effective research tool. So that is what we have incorporated. So the CE5 initiative, Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind Initiative, which is our primary research program, uh, utilizes lights and lasers, tones, and coherent thought sequencing. And these are all used together. Tomorrow night we'll go out to a remote ranch, this McGuire Ranch, and we'll practice these things and we'll see what happens. I always call them a dry run, but this thing that happened in Gulf Breeze was a dry run too, and we had five spacecraft come out, and there were some people who had to have quit put on some Depends undergarments. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, the the macho guys. We had a couple of retired Air Force uh, pilots there who uh, who who really just about you know lost it, and and actually one of them had to sit down on the pavement on, on the uh, asphalt. Uh, I now want to go into to that particular event. Oy vey, I'm running out of time. And show you these tapes. Um, let me describe what happened. There's the prelude, there's the event, and there's the post-event high strangeness. And that's the most fascinating stuff, actually. Let me go through it, and then we'll see the tape. The tape, by the way, is an amateur tape. Handheld, cheap camcorder. We didn't. We don't have a ninety thousand dollar beta cam with starlight scope. I wish we did, but we don't have the funds for it. Anybody want to donate one? Talk to me later. And uh, however, it's it's quite impressive. Unfortunately, this very small screen. We usually try to show it on one of the big, you know, four or five foot ones. But you guys, uh, when we show it, can come closer. Those of you in the back and sit out here on the floor or what have you. March thirteenth, I was on my way down there to Gulf Breeze, Florida, and subjectively acquired the information that at midnight there would be a sighting. And that's all I'll say about that. Now, this was the night that I was giving us to talk like this, and we had not done a workshop. And after the lecture, about 10.30, we went out to the Pensacola Bay Bridge at the base there on the Gulf Breeze side, and we began to observe the sky and, and whatnot. And we were using some of the lights and some of the protocols. You know, the, there were about 10 people there and only about four of them had gone through any of the training, so we weren't doing it in any formal way. 
At about 11.50 something, five of the 10 people left. Now I had told uh, Vicki Lyons and Art and Mary Hufford and several other people that there would be a sign in at about midnight. They said, well, no, it, it, it never appears that late. It's always between seven and 10 and it, you know, this doesn't happen. I said, well, it will, so just be quiet and we'll see. <laughs> well, at a, just a few minutes, in fact, what was interesting, the very last person of the 10, of the five who left, the very last person pulled out of the parking lot just as it appeared. This happens over and over and over again, and it's usually a mashugana. It's usually somebody who doesn't need to be there to begin with. It started, you know, we're going to get into the, what the right stuff is tomorrow in great detail. At any rate, the Gulf Breeze UFO appeared a few thousand feet off. It was not far, it was not miles away. And it, interestingly, it was over the hotel where I had just given the talk and in the direction of Santa Rosa Island. From that information, from its location, I deduced that the following night, when we were really going to go out as a whole team, that's where we should do our research. Well, it lasted only about a minute. Through binoculars, I could see not only the energy source at the base of it, but the superstructure of the craft that was shaped somewhat globular like that. And it was fascinating uh, that as soon as uh, Art Hufford got his 2,000 millimeter lens on it, it was gone. It just took off. Well, I thought that was interesting. I felt it was highly confirmatory, and I knew then that there would be some significant events. During the workshop, we played the tapes and we discussed what these tones and how we use them. Just as uh, we were about to break, there were uh, four women in the back of the room, and this was now about two hours after we had played these beeping tones, not the ones from the crop circles, but the beep, 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 beep. And all four of these women started hearing beep, 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 beep from an omnidirectional source. And they thought, guys, is there a watch? What is it? And this has happened over and over and over and over again with these tones. It's very much high strangeness. Now, actually, the first time I heard these tones, I went, I was at a conference and I went home and told my wife about it and as I was sitting in our uh, it was in July and as I was sitting in our kitchen the window was open as soon as I got animated and was talking about these beeping tones all of a sudden beep 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 came in from the window came inside the room circled around us and my wife is one of these earth mother pioneer ladies loves to live in a you know just loves to be pregnant loves to have children loves you know it's just <laughs> That's why we have four daughters, right? I only have female sperm. I mean, you know, that's you, if they hear that, you know, they, they, if they want a male from me, forget it. I only have female. But th this, this is something that's very strange about these tones. Well, we broke and we had dinner and then we got together and about 7 o'clock we headed out to Santa Rosa Island. Well, as fate would have it, about 12, 10 people got separated from the group because they didn't show up on time. And I'm one of the, I run a tight ship. That's another Freudian slip. <laughs> but it, you know, it's I'm very, it tended to be very punctual. And so it was seven o'clock and we left. They weren't there as tough, tough titties. Well, anyway, <laughs> we, we headed on out. Well, that turned out to be a very propitious, a very fortunate mistake, if there are any mistakes in this world, because half of the, those people went to South Shoreline Park and they had camcorders. And they just, you know, observed because they got separated and we had not disclosed our location. We usually do not disclose where we're going before we actually go out there for obvious security reasons. We went out to this location on Santa Rosa Island and it was really not a very, you know, I, I go to these places and I let people pick out these sites before I arrive and it turned out it was a disaster in terms of what my requirements are for an adequate CE5 site because it was right along the main road that connected Gulf Breeze and Navarro Beach. So, I mean, if you had a landing, you know, the whole world and God and everyone would see it. So, anyway, we, you know, we said that's fine. We went ahead and did it there. Well, we did the uh, coherent thought sequencing on site and then started using these lights, these very high powered lights. It was a beautiful crystal clear night with a moon and a very stiff wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico was behind us, Santa Rosa Sound was on the other side, and we were on this little strip of barrier island out there on Santa Rosa Island, um, where, where it's a state park. There's no buildings or homes or anything out there. Well, a few minutes after finishing the coherent thought sequencing and using the, doing the, what I call light work, not one or two or three, but five of these spacecraft 
came over. Now this had never been observed in Gulf Breeze where five of these had come out. They came out just exactly over Santa Rosa Sound where we were located, although they are frequently seen further towards into Gulf Breeze. And at that point, all hell broke loose and people started going, oh my God. It took some few minutes to get everyone under control. And I took one of these lights and started signaling. And these are trigger mechanism lights and flash. And by the way, these are strong enough that they can clearly be seen at four miles out. And they appeared within about a mile from our location. Deep throbbing on the tape, it shows it as white, but it's a deep throbbing white energy source ring of light with a superstructure craft above it. And that doesn't show up on the, because it's black and you can only see it through binoculars silhouetted against a slightly lighter sky. But it's a, uh, the, this sort of shaped craft. As I signaled to it, I would flash three times to it and pause and it flashed back three times. And then I flashed five times and pause and it flashed back five times. Well, this time point people really were running to go get their Depends undergarments. <laughs> because we had a confirmed lock-on. And this is, a, by the way, a substantial difference in a, in a passive observation. It's one thing to see a UFO. It's another thing to intentionally vector it in. They don't only send one, but they send five of these things out. And then they start signaling with you so that they know you're there. You're sitting there on the beach. You're going, boy, we feel really pretty exposed here, don't we? So this, this ensued. This went on for 15 minutes, signaling flashing back and forth. Now at one point you'll see on the tape where it looks like all but one of them sort of winks out or t takes off. And you'll hear everybody talking, oh it's over and blah blah blah, it ain't over yet. And then you'll hear on the second tape, two tapes that I'm going to show. One was taken from South Shoreline Park, which is not where we were doing the research. And the other one was taken on the site where we're doing the research. We actually have six tapes, so I brought two. Interestingly, the one, uh, at that point, people, I say, go ahead, continue to focus your mind, do coherent thought sequencing. And I started making a large equilateral triangle in the sky with these lights. Guess what? They came back, pop, 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 in a perfect equilateral triangle. It was really very awesome. It was a very moving moment. And I can tell you, the grown men there were crying. It was a very emotional moment because we knew that we had succeeded in a human-initiated voluntary lock-on and that they were dancing, this photon dance. It was lovely, very, very exciting. It's an understatement. <laughs> now, there were a number of guys there who, after the event, said this was the most important event of their life. And these were people who had had extraordinary close encounters on their own, but they'd always been involuntary or passively observed. And this was such a step to be able to say, we're going to reach out and see if they will answer. And they answered. And it went on for 15 minutes. You know, if there had just been a flyby, we would have been happy. But to have it go on for 15 minutes, this was really special. Well, at that point, I started saying, now we need to start doing something, which I had not done during the workshop, and select a boarding party. Because our intention was to get them to land on the beach behind us and have a boarding party go on board. At that point, four people, immediately forthwith and forever, jumped in their car and went back to Pensacola. <laughs> The rest of us were left to dis dis discover how it is that we would do this. Well, at that point, I started signaling to the UFO in a strobe-like fashion. And as I did so, the lead craft strobe in perfect synchrony. This, unfortunately, is lost on the tape because they were on tripods and they didn't tr couldn't turn them up directly overhead. But it strobed and came directly overhead, flared out a bright white light, and then was gone. And that was the end of the event that night. Interestingly, immediately after that, there was a flurry of helicopter and jet aircraft activity <laughs> that may have been a coincidence, but maybe not. Moreover, we stayed out till 5 a.m. I tend to have a frightening stamina for this stuff, so be warned. Uh, and the, uh, I wear out everybody. <laughs> My wife says, please, be quiet, go to sleep. No. Uh, Actually, there's a story about that. When we first got married, I used to talk, and she'd say, oh, can we go to bed? And she'd, finally she'd go, oh, I'm so tired. Let's go to sleep. Anyway. You don't have to be crazy to do this, but it helps. What happened at this point uh, was that we observed two unmarked cars that went north and south of our position until 5 a.m. 
and one of them was a pickup. Both of them had males in them, single males, and unless they were cruising or something, I don't think they were out there for the, on a Saturday night for the enjoyment of the stars. But at any rate, I do think we had a security breach at that site, and, and no further events happened uh, into the night. By the way, when we pulled out of there at 5 a.m., the guy in the pickup truck was pulled over in the dunes just above our position and was still sitting there looking out. It was very strange. Um, We've tried to take care of some of this stuff. Uh, we'll get into that tomorrow. Now, the significance of this, the congruency of the time, this was no doubt this was a first degree CE5 where these craft were vectored in with second degree components to it after they appeared, the signaling, the formation of a triangle. Uh, I think that it vindicated a lot of, of what we've been trying to do. It affirmed for many people that not only did the protocols work, but that they were as eager and excited for a diplomatic liaison as we were. In fact, if you want to get into some weirdness, we'll talk about some remote viewing experiences that a number of people there had, four different people before any appeared, and I was one of them that said it verbally, that there were five, four or five spacecraft on their way, and that's how many came. And moreover, that the people on board were inordinately excited and that there was a link up between these occupants and a federation or some sort of a central control system, uh, uh, system uh, and they were getting directions to go there to greet this party. Later, someone from California appeared in Denver at the end of May when I was at a conference and said that they had received information from a couple of contact sources that this interplanetary group or federation was extremely excited that an altruistic group of humans had finally gotten the act together to go out and greet them and say hello. There was a great, I can say that I think they were more excited than we were. Well, the fun is just now beginning. Post-event high strangeness. <laughs> Now, you know, it, you know, you go from astonishment to astonishment, and you know, it's like the, the Chinese curse me, you live in interesting times. <laughs> two, of these, two of these people went home who had been there. She had the flu. It was about 11.30. And they had been playing with a little toy UFO, okay, that morning with their grandchild. And the darn thing wouldn't work. They put in new batteries. They put in the old batteries. It wouldn't work. It was kaput. They went home, 11.30 at night, nobody in the house, completely empty, everything off, except they opened the door, and guess what? This little toy UFO is whirling around like this on the counter with all its lights beeping and flashing, and the switch was in the off position. Now, this is absolutely true. This is like something out of a Steven Spielberg movie. Now. To make things even more extraordinary, Vicki Lyons went home. The next morning she got up and all of a sudden there was this vibration around and above her house. Her, what do you call it, remote control thing for her television and VCR got so warm she could barely hold it. All of a sudden there were these items, these music boxes up on a shelf above uh, at the top of the ceiling. She hasn't touched for months. And all of a sudden, one of them started going ding, 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 just like the beep, beep, beep. What did she get? She went, oh, my God. Well, she and Patty Weatherford and several other people subsequently that day and for the following week heard this beep, 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 beep when they'd be in their car, when they'd be out. Now, none of them were frightened by this. They all knew, all these working group people knew that this was an affirmation that, yes, you're on the right track. That's how everyone took it. Nobody was frightened. It, and, and, and it also showed, I think, a marvelous sense of humor to go home and, and have this thing whirling on the shelf. I mean, it, it's great. It's absolutely uh, classic. So the implications of this are fairly immense. I think we've entered a new historic chapter that will be marked by human-initiated and or human cooperative efforts. To the extent that we can put together the right stuff and teams of people around the world who have the right stuff, to that extent, involuntary experiences will decrease. That's a prediction I'm making. I may be wrong. I don't think so. 
if we can mount a non-hostile diplomatic response, not based on the acquisition of someone else's technology, not based on exploitation, not based in fear, but in love, in the oneness of intelligent life in the universe, I am quite confident that this will take us to the stars. It is a matter of a degree between a lock-on, like what you're going to see on this tape, and having a full landing with a boarding party going on board. That could have happened within one minute. It didn't happen because we weren't ready for it. I can tell you that the people there, there were not enough people there who could have kept their act together in that scenario. And believe me, the people who say, oh, sure, have them come, well, schmooze, we'll have a, a malt together, you know, those are the most dangerous people. They have no self-realization whatsoever. Um, this is something that I think we are on a path that will take us into a new chapter in human history. It will be first embryonic. It will grow to be born into the broad daylight as an infant. That will be happening in the coming months to years, not decades. And it will mature into a full interaction and incorporation of planetary societies with our planet Earth. This is where we're headed. It is destiny, and it is manifesting. And I suggest that we embrace our future because it is a wonderful one. I have no fear of it. And I think that the challenge is for us to come into our light, to say, we can do this. You know, here I am, little Stevie. I, you know, you still think yeah, I'm Stevie. I was Stevie when I was little. You know, little red-headed guy from the South and came from a very poor family. And you think, you know, we can't, I can't do this. You know, we can do it, and we must. The time is to let go of our limitations. The time has come for us to embrace our potential. And if we do this, and do it with the right purpose, we, will, I, we are assured of success. It will change the planet overnight. As soon as we have something, uh, Larry King on CNN has wanted me to be on to discuss this. I have declined because he wanted to have me on with crackpots and, and, and what's his name, Phil Class and God knows who all. But um, if we are successful in this and they permit, now this is something we'll discuss tomorrow, we do not always turn on our camcorders. The first few minutes of this event is not recorded because I would not allow until we had a confirmed signal lock on for the cameras to be turned on because I do not assume that they want to be. I mean, look, if they wanted to be totally filmed, they could land in Yankee Stadium in a live transmission and that'd be it. So, I mean, we don't assume that. And, and again, this is part of diplomatic etiquette. It's very important. We're going to get into a lot of discussion of what diplomatic etiquette is, what interplanetary diplomatic etiquette might be. But I think that to the extent that we can successfully put that together and they are willing to cooperate and trust us, we will be able to document a very close, and I predict, a daytime landing with multiple witnesses. When this goes on CNN, it'll be something to behold. And we are setting up that network, so indeed that can happen, and it, it will happen. Why don't we go ahead? We're running out of time. I know I'm taking up your break time. I'm going to show this tape. Now, I'm going to show this tape, and there's the tape of the... Oh, God, I haven't even gotten into this uh, gashrai. Um, we have a land... This crash... We have a spacecraft that crashed. Those of you who need to see might want to come up closer. This one that crashed and was retrieved on August 18, 1991 in Ontario, Canada, uh, is a lengthy tape, I'm afraid. Uh, I'll try to... We'll, we'll try to see the important parts of it and maybe some of the rest of it we can show tomorrow. Uh, the first tape you're going to see was taken from South Shoreline Park uh, by Wayne Peterson, who is a C-SETI working group member in New Orleans. Um, by the way, the full report of this, uh, Carol Singer, if you'll raise your hand, she has these papers that have the complete report of what happened in Gulf Breeze and also what happened in Belgium. I haven't even gotten into that, but there was an extraordinary CE5 that happened with our executive committee that flew over to, to Belgium in February in the sleet and rain and God knows what else to do some research. And uh, there are a number of other papers in there. Yeah, those are $7 to cover the printing and whatnot. They're about 80 pages. 
they're very poorly typed. You know, we're just completely overwhelmed with the clerical stuff with this organization. And if it weren't for my wife and a few other people, it'd be a disaster. Um, God bless her. Uh, we'll go ahead and show this first tape again. It was from South Shoreline Park. Uh, he was able to get four of the five UFOs on the film initially. Um, and uh, he, he's, well, you'll hear it. It's just, it's just wild, uh, the reactions of what happened. Have you got it for life for yeah. I think it's down there. Do you want these lights off? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay, are you ready now? Yeah. were within 2,000 feet of our location. And look, there's four. There's four. There's five, but he doesn't There's even, four. Here's the fourth one that he gets. There's another one low on the horizon down here. You can hear the wind. Holy That's damn hot shit. <laughs> <laughs> There was some classified material that fell off the bottom. That's what he was saying. Something's dropping, something's dropping. These are the four that he was able to get.
helium balloons and candles are just FOS. <laughs> because uh, there is no way for 15 minutes that these things were definitely, you can see structured above here, you can see a structured craft with binoculars. The energy source is at the bottom of these things. Oh, yeah. Now, what's happening here? They're coming in closer, and he has to keep backing up to get them into his viewfinder. They're spreading out. He thinks they're spreading out. Because I have to keep backing up to keep them in frame. <laughs> maybe they're coming in Maybe they're coming in close. There's some argument there about that. <laughs> the woman was correct. <laughs> Anyway, this goes on. Let's get on to the other case.